Okay, so this is a Zoom meeting for Physics 231C. We've been studying this week waves and sound. That's chapter 11. The reading quiz for chapter 11 is due today. And then the problem set is due Monday. Monday <clears throat> is the Monday of Thanksgiving week. So we'll finish waves and sound Monday. We'll go on to the next chapter, chapter 12. That's on temperature and ideal gases. Um, we won't have a reading quiz for chapter 12 because of the Thanksgiving uh, break, but we will have a problem set <clears throat> due a week from Monday, the 27th, and then the next day is exam three. So in the next few days before Thanksgiving, um, and then uh, after Thanksgiving, the weekend or the Monday, you'll have to prepare for the exam. And the main thing is make a help sheet for the exam. You can use the same help sheets that you used on exam one and exam two, but then you'll want a third page for exam for uh, chapter chapters nine through twelve. All right, so things are going to start happening faster because after Thanksgiving, we just have two weeks until final exams. All right, now for today, we should review chapter 11 on waves and sound. So let's look at what's in that chapter. You've already read chapter 11, no doubt, but and you hopefully you've taken notes. But anyway, you should understand all of these equations that I have here. Section one is just a general section on the mathematical description of waves. And you have to understand how to calculate wavelength, period, frequency, and the propagation speed or the propagation velocity, the wave velocity. So these parameters of a wave, and of course also the the amplitude, although that doesn't come, come in so much, but that's just how strong the wave is. All right, then we have section two on interference and standing waves. Um, not so much important interference, but standing waves. When you have waves in a, um, restricted, volume like waves on a stretched string or waves in an organ pipe or a musical instrument. So again, you should have these equations written down in your notebook from reading the chapter. There's a relation between the wavelength and the length of the region in which the wave is produced. So that would be, for example, the length of a guitar string or the length of a, so that would be a string under tension. And there's also a formula that determines 
the speed. The speed, for example, for a guitar string is the square root of the tension in the string divided by the mass per unit length. So the square root of T over mu. And sometimes you'll have to use that equation. So again, that's the kind of equation you should have in your, written down in your notebook. Then section three is um, specifically sound waves. Sound waves are longitudinal waves in a medium like air or water. Well, we're mostly familiar with sound in air, but there's also sound waves that occur in materials, like in water. The intensity, definition of intensity, is the power per unit area. That's one way to describe it. Um, So power per unit area or energy per unit time per unit area. Because power is energy per unit time. So, you know, there's a wave traveling somewhere a uh, sound wave traveling somewhere that you're that you're hearing, it's carrying energy. It carries a certain amount of energy that depends on the amplitude and the uh, frequency and so on. I didn't write down the equation for um, energy density in a sound wave. But anyway, power per unit area is defined as intensity. The more power it carries, the louder it is. Now, instead of expressing intensity as what would be the units here, watts per square meter, it's uh, common in the problems that, which involve sound to define the sound level, that's called beta, and that's measured in decibels. It's a logarithmic scale. So the level beta is 10 times the log of I over I zero, where I zero is some standard uh, intensity value. I've forgotten the value, I forgot to write down the amount of I zero, but that'll be in the book. Uh, you should have that written down. Um, the higher the intensity, the more decibels you have. But it's not intensity, it's the log of intensity divided by that standardized I zero calibration intensity. If I is equal to the calibration, I is equal to I zero, then you have here the log of one. Well, the log of one is zero. So when I is equal to I zero, that calibrated, that's sort of the minimum intensity that you can hear, then the number of decibels is zero, zero decibels. You can, of course, have decibels less than zero. That just means I is less than I zero. And now as you increase I, you increase the number of decibels. So, but it's a logarithmic scale. So if you made I 10 times I zero, you'd have 10 decibels because the log of 10 is one. If you made I a hundred times more intense, then you'd have level 20. If you made I a thousand times more intense, then you'd have decibels 30. So it's a logarithmic scale. 
And there'll be some homework problems where you have to convert between intensities and decibel values. Uh, musical instruments, that's section four. So for example, if you have organ pipe, typical organ pipe is closed at one end and open at the other end. So there's a relationship between the length of the organ pipe and the wavelength. And of course, if you know the wavelength, you can also figure out the frequency because speed of sound, which is approximately 343, at least at room temperature, meters per second, is wavelength times frequency. So if you know the wavelength, you can use this equation to calculate the frequency. So musical instruments, uh, you know, they could be string instruments like a violin or uh, pipes, like a flute, for example. They, they, are, they have oscillatory motions going on inside, and that produces a sound wave which propagates away from the instrument. So there are oscillations occurring in the instrument which produce sound waves. That's the source of sound waves, which will then travel away from the instrument in all directions infinitely. Well, of course, the intensity decreases as one over the distance squared. And then finally, section five is on a special physics effect called the Doppler effect. Everybody knows the Doppler effect when a, when a sound source is moving towards you or moving away from you, it'll have a different frequency, a different pitch than it would have if you were at rest. I mean, if it was not moving towards you or away from you. So there are these equations one equation, if the source is approaching the observer, let's say you're the observer, let's say the source is a police car. If the police car is moving towards you, then there'll be a higher frequency. F prime is the frequency you observe. F is the frequency that you would observe if the police car were not moving. The denominator here is a number less than one. So if you divide by a number less than one, that's the same as multiplying by a number greater than one. You'll find a higher frequency. And that's something everybody has, everybody has experienced that. And on the other hand, if the police car is moving away from you, so it's receding, then um, the denominator here would be greater than one. So you'd be dividing by a number greater than one the frequency would be lower. All right, so those are the equations that you, you know, you should already have those written in your notebook from reading the, the chapter, but be sure you have equations like that on the help sheet for the exam that's coming up. Now, at these Zoom meetings, we usually go over a few problems that are in the assignment. So these problems are assigned for Monday night. Um, here's one that's taken out of the book, I guess. It's problem 88 from the end of the chapter. What if you double the sound intensity? What is the change in the sound level? Of course, if the sound intensity goes up, then the number of decibels increases. So if you doubled the sound intensity, increased by a factor of two, there would be more decibel, a higher number of decibels, a higher, there'd be an increase in the sound level. So sound intensity, you have to know is power per unit area. That's in the units watts per meter squared. Sound level, which is expressed in decibels, is 10 times the log of I over I zero. Or you could turn this around and write that the in intensity is this standardized minimum intensity I zero times 10 to the power beta over 10. 
point one beta is the number of bells. Beta is the number of decibels. So if I2 is two times I1, and you want to calculate beta two minus beta one, the increase, the change in beta, change in beta would be the final value, I two minus the initial value, beta one. Then you would have log I two over I zero minus log of I one over I zero. Now you think back to high school algebra, the log of A minus the log of B is the log of A divided by B. So you could write this as the log I2 over I0 divided by I1 over I0. The I0 cancels out, so you just get the log of I2 over I1 from this uh, property of the logarithm, which you probably remember from high school algebra. So what's the answer to the question? What's the increase in the sound level? Well, it's this delta beta. It's 10 times the log of two. I think the log of two is about 0.3. So it's about three, 10 times three, 10 times 0.3. So it's about three decibels. So, you know, it's a logarithmic scale. If you, if you double the intensity, you increase the sound level by adding three more decibels. Or well, here's um, problem 89. Move away from a sound source from some initial distance R1 to uh, farther away R2, which is in fact twice as far. So move twice as far from a sound source. When you're close to the sound source, it'll be loud. And as you move farther away, it'll be quieter. It'll be low, uh, less less loud. The intensity is proportional to one over the distance squared. And that's an example of the conservation of energy. You know, you have waves spreading out from the source. So here's the source. Maybe it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a violin. So here's the source. Or it could be a, it could be a loudspeaker. Well, it's producing sound in all directions, and the waves are traveling away from the source. So there's a certain amount of energy passing this sphere R one per second. Well, all of that energy will pass through this sphere a little later, but energy is conserved. So there'll be just as much energy per second going through the nearby sphere as there are going through the far away sphere. And, you know, the area of the sphere goes like R squared. So the intensity goes like one over R squared. The intensity times the area is the total power. Well, the total power going through this close-in sphere is just the same as the total power going through this far away sphere. So the power is the same, but the intensity is smaller because you're farther away. So I2 is the power of the loudspeaker divided by A2. I1 is the power of the same loudspeaker divided by A1. So this is just the power per unit area. That's the intensity. And it's the same power because it's the same loudspeaker producing the power that goes through this sphere and the power that goes through this sphere. So when you calculate I2 divided by I1, that'll just be A1 divided by I2. Because the power cancels. Now A2... Uh, let's see. Now we want to know the change in the level. So that's beta two minus beta one. 
that's a change in a level. That's just like the previous problem, 10 times the log I2 over I1. I2 over I1 is A1 over A2. The areas go like the radius squared. So that'll be R1 squared over R2 squared. And R2 is two times R1, so that'll be one over four. I2 over I1 will be one over four. And now the log of one over four is negative. The log of a number greater than one is positive. The log of a number less than one is negative. So that'll be negative the log of four. So minus the log of four times 10. So, you know, you're going to get some practice using logarithms. And uh, no doubt there'll be a problem like that on the on the third midterm exam. This, this relation, this is one you should probably have written down in your help sheet. Intensity is the total power. That's the power produced by the source divided by the area. Now, what's the area? Well, it's the area that the waves are going through. And the waves are going out in all directions. I've only got it drawn here in two dimensions, but it's really a three-dimensional area. It's the surface of a sphere. Hard to draw in three dimensions. So what's the area of a sphere? The area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. Area is 4 pi r squared. That's, you know, that goes back to discovered by Archimedes. All right, so that's another problem involving decibels. Here's another problem from the book, it's problem 93, or it's related to problem 93. It looks like it's been rewritten a little bit. This has to do with the Doppler effect. A bat emits ultrasound with some frequency F. So it has some sort of sound producing organ in its body and it's emitting high frequency, ultrasound means very high frequency, high frequency pulses of sound. And a bat has big ears because it can, so, <clears throat> so that it can hear the reflections. So that the bat will emit a sound It'll bounce off uh, any object and come back, and the bat will hear it. And the bat can use its brain to uh, perceive how far it is from the object that it, that uh, reflected the sound. Now, it says here, at what frequency does the bat perceive the reflected wave? There's a Doppler effect here. In fact, there are two Doppler effects here. There's a double Doppler effect. The bat emits a frequency F. That wave goes off, and let's say he's flying towards the wall of the cave where he is. He don't want to run into the cave. He don't want to run into that wall, so he wants to sense the fact, you know, it's black inside a cave. There's no light in the cave, so he wants to locate the cave wall by sound, kind of sonar. Well, okay, so the sound travels and hits the wall of the cave. Now, 
because the bat is moving, the frequency of the sound reflecting from the wall is not the same as the frequency emitted by the bat because of the Doppler effect. You know, the, the wall is sort of the receiver. The bat is the source, and the source is moving towards the wall. So this is a case where the frequency will be higher. Just like when you're uh, standing on a street and there's a police car coming towards you, you'll hear the frequency, you hear the pitch of the sound of the police car siren at a higher frequency. So the frequency absorbed by the wall, we'll call that F1, is, we had the formula before, it's the Doppler formula. It's the frequency emitted divided by 1 minus V over C, or I could write it this way, C over C minus V. Now, you have to know which velocity is which. V here is the velocity of the bat. Of course, the wall is not moving. C is the speed of sound. So the speed of sound, I don't know, a typical speed of sound would be 343 degrees. At 20 degrees Celsius, the speed of sound is 343 meters per second. Sound, sound speed depends on temperature. At room temperature, it's 343. But it depends on temperature. So in fact, you should know, you should have written down in your help sheet the temperature dependence of the speed of sound. But anyway, let's just take 343 meters per second. <clears throat> now, the wall will vibrate <clears throat> as a result of that sound wave. And if anything that vibrates produces sound waves. So the wall will emit sound waves. We sometimes call that reflection. It's really a kind of sound generation. <clears throat> the incoming wave causes the material in the wall to vibrate that vibration will produce sound waves which are coming back away from the wall. And that's the sound wave that the bat will hear. Now, again, the frequency of the emitted sound, which we calculated in the first part, F1, will be changed by the Doppler effect from the fact that the receiver and the um, source are coming together. Not because the source is moving, but because the receiver is moving. But it's the same formula. Well, no, you got to be a little careful. The Doppler formula is quite complicated. The Doppler formula says F of the observer is C plus or minus V0 divided by C plus or minus Vs times F of the source. So V0 is the velocity, uh, I guess it's the speed of the observer. Vs is the speed of the source. C is the speed of sound, 343 meters per second. Now, you know, so you have a ratio of two expressions. Now, should it be plus or should it be minus? Well, uh, that depends on whether you're talking about the frequency being higher or lower. But here you have the frequency F1 will be observed by the bat since it's moving towards the wall at a higher frequency, F2. Just like if you were in a car driving towards, towards a stationary police car with its siren on, you would hear the siren at a higher frequency. 
But in this case, it's not this formula, it's this formula. Because in this case, it's the observer, namely the bat that's moving. So that would be C plus V over C. So you can always figure out which is the correct sign by just remembering whether the frequency is going to be higher or lower. So F2, that's the frequency that the bat observes, will be greater than F1. And F1 will be greater than F. And the problem is to calculate F2. So it's a double Doppler effect. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, the answer to this is in the back of the book. But these numbers are probably changed. So your answer won't be the same as the answer at the back of the book. But the way to do this problem is first do the problem using the numbers that are given in the book and check that you get the answer in the back of the book. Then do the problem over again using the numbers that are given by Lon Kappa. And you should get the right answer. All right. Here's a problem involving a musical instrument, a piano string. So here's a piano string. A piano string is tied to the board of the piano at both ends. So the ends of the string can't move. So the oscillation of the string looks like this. It'll be a harmonic oscillation. It's a standing wave. It's a standing wave where both ends are nodes. They're uh, points where there's no deflection of the string. Now this would be the fundamental frequency. And you can see from the picture, the fundamental frequency is half a wavelength because a complete wavelength would be deflected up, then deflected down. That would make a full wave. So it's it's got a half a frequency. So in other words, the length of the string is half a frequency or the, sorry, half a wavelength or the wavelength is two times the length of the string. I guess the length of the string is given. And of course, the frequency is the speed of the wave divided by the wavelength. Now, what wave are we talking about here? We're not talking about the wave in the air. We're talking about the wave in the stretched string. So you need this relationship, which gives you the speed of a wave in a stretched spring. string. It's the square root of the tension over the mass distance, over the mass per unit length. So let's check the units. It's the square root of tension as a force. Force is kilogram meters per second squared. Mass times acceleration is kilogram meter per second squared. So there's, that's a Newton. That's the force unit. And the mass density, mass per unit length, will be kilogram per meter. So you see the kilograms cancel. You have meters divided by one over meters. That'll be meters squared in the numerator. You have a second squared in the denominator. And then you square root. So the units will be meters per second, which is what should be because it's speed. It's the speed of the wave in the piano wire. You know, that's a transverse oscillation. Of course, the waves in the air will come off in this direction as longitudinal oscillations in the, in the air. All right, so we have a formula for frequency in terms of the length of the uh, piano wire. It's 1 over 2L times the square root of T over mu. 
Now they actually give you in this problem two different, let's see, two different frequencies. 440 is the frequency you want. 436 is the frequency you have. Of course, the length of the string is the same. The length of the string is constant because it's tied down at both ends on immovable pins. So the length of the string is constant, but the tension can be different. You, you uh, turn up the strength here, you'll get a larger tension. So the tension will be uh, what you have to calculate. That's the unknown. Oh, no, it tells you the tension. The tension is increased by 12 newtons. The unknown is mu. It's mu. So this is a problem where you have to write down two equations, and then you have two equations for two unknowns. I mean, one equation is that the ratio of the frequencies, the length will cancel, the mu will cancel, U doesn't change, it's just the tension that changes. So you'll get the ratio of the frequencies is the square root of T0 over T0 plus 12 newtons. And um, you know this, so the only unknown in this equation is T0, so you solve for two, T0. That's the problem. What's, no, there are two unknowns. So that'll give you T zero, but that's not what you want. What you want is the linear mass density. So you have to have another equation. Well, you could use this equation, for example. Once you know T, you can calculate what mu has to be. So it comes down to an algebraic equation, an algebraic problem with two equations and two unknowns, and you're supposed to give the unknown mass density. Now let's see, is that everything? I guess that's everything. Um, anybody have any questions? Let me make sure I've got all the. Yeah, that's everything. Anybody want to ask a question about these problems or about the exam or about the another problem on the assignment? I'll stop the recording.